class, our future worship leader right here. <laughs> As I am um, watching what to watch on TV, you know, there's just, there's just not a whole lot to watch on TV anymore. So I'm constantly channel surfing what I want to watch. So I want to watch... Uh, uh, the news? Nope. I want to watch sports? Nope. I want to, I, you know, and so I have drifted. Um, we have Dish Network, and I have drifted over to uh, uh, channel something like 250. And I have been watching about the last 10 years of reruns from uh, Hogan's Heroes and Gomer Pyle. Remember all those good ones? Man, that's some good stuff right there. Um, and, uh, and, Green Acres, I, don't know, I watched Green Acres, it wasn't my favorite, but I got into Green Acres a little bit, and then Hee Haw, anybody watch Hee Haw, remember Hee Haw, man, oh man, uh, <clears throat> see if this jars your memory just a little bit here, right here. <laughs> <laughs> That's about the best TV on right now. <laughs> you, know? Um, you know, as I look around, uh, I think it's been said several times that these are tough times. And for many of us, boy, it feels like if there were, if if it wasn't for bad news, there'd be no news at all. I don't know about you, but I'm I'm kind of getting tired of the bad news, and and I feel like it's time for some good news. Amen. Amen. So. So that's what I want to talk to you today about. I want to talk to you about some good news. Let me start off by telling you about John Newton. John Newton was a man who wrote a lot of books and a lot of sermons, probably very few that you have ever heard, uh, because he lived hundreds of years ago, from 1725 to 1807. But he wrote one song that I think every one of you, even if you don't read old stuff, he wrote one song that I think every one of you will know. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me, help me with it, I once was, but now I was blind, but now I see. What a powerful song. Newton didn't start out a Christian songwriter. Matter of fact, most of his life, he didn't embrace Jesus. The story goes he had a godly mother, but he had a wretched father, wicked father. And as a youngster, he chose to be like dad and became a sailor like his father. Eventually, he got involved in the slave, tra uh, slave trade, and he was buying and selling slaves. But as nothing ever stays the same, and at some point his fortune reversed, and he became a slave himself, sunk pretty, pretty low. Matter of fact, it said that the lady who owned him used to tie him or chain him to a table, and the only thing that he could eat was the scraps that fell off the table. That's how low he sunk. But at one time, as a sailor, a sailor he came across a book, The Imitation of Christ. He picked up that book and began to read that book aboard that ship. One day a ferocious storm blew up and a big wave washed him off the deck of that ship into the ocean. You can believe it or not. He began to pray and beg God for mercy. And at that very moment another wave came up and washed John Newton back onto the ship or the deck of the ship. That's all he needed. It's all he needed. From that moment, he fell to his knees and he got right with God. And he returned to his quarters and wrote that song, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a slave trader, that saved a wretch, that saved a slave, that saved a wretch like me. Amazing Grace. 
What is grace? What is grace? Simply put, it is the unmerited favor and kindness uh, shown to somebody who does not deserve it, and there is absolutely no way that they can earn it. And may I just tell you this morning that you are going to be saved by God's grace or you will not be saved at all. It's by God's grace. It is by the grace of God. And friend, I want you to know that the good news today is that grace never ends. Somebody say amen. God's grace never ends. You know, we read all kinds of things in the Bible <laughs> that seem a little heavy. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 says, Everybody has sinned. We've all fallen short of the expectation of God. And Romans 6, 23 says, the wages of that sin is death. We're, we, we deserve death. And that's bad news when you, when you read it. But you know what? It's the bad news sometimes that makes the good news even better. Let's begin reading. Take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 4. And we're going to begin in verse 1. The Bible says Abraham was, humanly speaking, the founder of the J Jewish nation. Here's what he discovered about being made right with God. If good deeds could make you acceptable to God, well, then it would be something that we would be able to boast about. But that is not God's way. For the scriptures tell us Abraham believed God, and as a result, God counted him as righteous because of his faith. When people work for something, their wages, they're not a gift. They're something that they have earned. But people are counted as righteous not because of their work not because of something they've earned but because of their faith in almighty God who forgives sinners what we're going to do this morning is we're going to hear some good news from the mouths of three different men Abraham David and the apostle Paul so let's start out with Abraham let's take a look at the good news that Abraham discovered friend Chapter 1, or verse 1 says, he discovered what makes people right with Almighty God. It can be said for the Jews that Abraham was the founder of their nation, if you will, the founder of their faith. They held him in the highest of esteem, and if anybody could earn their way into heaven, it would have been this man, Abraham. But the Bible says that God counted him as righteous, not because of what he had done, but because of his belief, because of his faith. And that quote was an exact quote from Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6. Now, Abraham did not start out as righteous. Matter of fact, God called him uh, when he was a heathen in the land of Ur. Uh, and God told him in, in chapter 12 and verse 1 of Genesis, I want you to leave your country, leave your relatives, leave your family, your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. So Abraham moved out and did that in faith, believing God in faith, he moved out under sealed orders, not even knowing what the entire plan was. And in Genesis chapter 15, beginning in verse 1 through 6, the Bible says that later on God speaks to Abraham in a vision and he tells him, don't be afraid for I will protect you and your reward for following me will be great. And Abraham thinks about that for a second. And he comes back in verse 2 and says, well, Lord, if that's the case, what good are all your blessings in my life when I can't see them? What good are the things that you promise if I can't see them? He said, I don't even have a son. Since you've given me no children, a servant in my household will inherit all of my wealth. You've given me no descendants of my own, so one of my servants will be my heir. And then the Lord said to him, no, your servant will not be your heir, for you will have a son of your own who will be your heir. And then the Lord took Abram outside, and he said to him, Look up at the stars in the sky. Count them if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. And Abram believed uh, the Lord, and the Lord counted unto him as righteous because of his faith. Now by this time, uh, Abram is an old man. His wife, Sarah, has already went through menopause and past childbearing years. And so, in short, she is not, uh, they couldn't have a child. But God said, don't focus on the things that you can see. Don't focus on things as they appear because I'm going to give you a son. Matter of fact, Abram, do you see the stars out there? Well, yes, Lord. Then I want you to go out and try to count them because that's how numerous your descendants are going to be. God said, I'm going to work a miracle in your life. And rather than debating God or doubting God, Abraham just chose to believe God. 
He believed God, and God said, you know what? That's all I've ever wanted from you was for you to believe, and I count as righteous. I count you as righteous because of it. But what exactly did Abraham believe God for in this case? Well, he believed God for a miracle, and he believed God specifically for a son. And that is exactly what Jesus was, the descendant of Abraham, a miracle son born of a virgin. It's a miracle. You see, Abraham chose to believe in a God who brings life out of death. The Bible said the womb of Sarah was dead, uh, and God brought life from death. And so Abraham had an incredible faith in Almighty God. Let me ask you, uh, how was your faith in the grace of God this morning? How was your faith in God's grace doing this morning? What does accepting grace even do? What did Abraham discover? Well, first of all, I want to share this with you. He discovered that God's grace respects God's glory. You can write that down in your outline if you would, please. Romans chapter 4 and verse 12 says, If Abraham's good deeds had made him acceptable to God, that is, had, if he had been justified by that, if he had been put in a right relationship with God because of what he had done, well, then he would have had something to boast about. But that is not God's way. Meaning, if Abraham could have been good uh, and, uh, and that would have got him into heaven, well, he had, would have something to brag about and he could have earned God's favor and he could have looked around and said, you know what? look at me and look at all of the stuff that I have done to make this happen but he would have missed that the salvation in the Bible that is offered to us by God every bit of it is a gift of Almighty God you see when it says Abraham believed God it means that Abraham gave God the glory somebody say man Abraham gave God glory see people do all kinds of things to earn favor with God some people uh, uh, across this planet will take whips and beat themselves across their back until they ble bleed. It, they, they will. They will. Some people will mutilate themselves or bathe in, the, in, in a filthy river thinking that that will somehow draw them close to God and glorify God. Some people will hang themselves from hooks and, and meditate for hours to get close to God. I've read of people who will allow themselves to be crucified, not not killed but crucified and then taken off the cross uh, uh, to be uh, to in order to glorify God it happens every year in the Philippines right people will go on pilgrimages to different places uh, to a shrine in order to glorify God people have given huge sums of money in an attempt to glorify God but do you want to know what do you want to know what glorify what glorifies God the most I'm telling you it is believing God for who he is and for what he says somebody say man that's what glorify God when I speak at other places and I have over the years when I've spoken at other places and people introduce me Usually in an introduction to a guest speaker, usually people say, have a tendency to say nice things, okay? <laughs> I've never had one thing I have never had anybody say about me is, well, we want to welcome Pastor Rumor with us this morning. And by the way, just know you can't believe a single thing the man says. <laughs> I've never had anybody say that about me, okay? Now, no matter how many nice things you say about me, if you say you can't believe me, well, then you can't believe him. Well, then what have you done? You've just cut to the very essence or the very root of my character, haven't you? 1 John 5.10 says this, He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe in God makes God a liar. The greatest thing, my friend, that you and I can do to glorify God is to believe God for what God promises and what God says. It's the greatest thing we can do. Faith, not fear, pleases God. Why? Because it glorifies God. And God rewards faith. So if I want to please God, then I've got to believe God for what God is saying in his word. And by the way, faith uh, is not uh, waiting for God to prove it to me and then believing it. No, faith is the response to the nature and the character of God. You see, faith believes God, not for what God has done, but for who God is. When my eye is right. My eye responds to light. When my ears are right, my ears respond to sound. When my heart is right, my heart responds to God in faith. 
in faith. And that glorifies God. Listen, if we could be saved by our own diligence or efforts or actions or knowledge or wisdom, then God would not get all the glory. And the person who accomplished some of those things would receive some of the glory. But when a person is justified or put into a right relationship with God through faith, uh, then God receives the glory because that's what we're believing in to get us to where we need to go. Heaven, God gets the glory. We're made right through God. It's amazing how people tempt to meld up what they do or what they know or who they are or how holy they think they are uh, uh, with, with, uh, with faith and works together in order to be saved. Why? I just think there's something about human pride that says, look at me, we need to be a part of this thing and turns the focus to us. Suppose, now Todd's back for the first time in four months. And suppose Todd would say, well, you know what, preacher, I, man, I really feel bad for being away, and, but I'll tell you what, it's been a good four months to be gone because I hit the jackpot, and I'm extremely wealthy now, preacher, and you know what, I love you and I've missed you so much, I want to do something very, very special for you, I want to buy you a brand new truck of your choice. Now, brother Todd, I want to tell you something, I ain't cheap, brother, I want me a brand new Ford F-350 diesel, that's about $85,000 for those of you who ain't been shopping lately. That's a nice truck. But suppose Todd says, no, nope, I'm glad. I, I, I love you, preacher. I think you deserve it. I want you to go ahead and get that truck. And I said, well, thanks a lot, Todd. But you know what? I just, I think that's a big burden for you to carry. And I don't think you should have to do that by yourself. It's too much for you to spend. So let me help you pay for it. Hey, let's just say I reach into my pocket and I pull out a quarter. Now, mind you, if I pull out a quarter, Todd still owes $84,999.75, does he not? Okay? And I pull out a quarter. And let's say that I drive into that parking lot next Sunday in my brand new Ford F-350 diesel, $85,000 ride leather, sunroof, the whole bells and whistles. And you all say, nice truck, preacher. And I say, well, that, I get, thank you, thank you. Me and Todd bought it. That'd be ridiculous, would it not? That'd be crazy. Friend, I want you to know. When we, when we add our two cents to what God does, I'm telling you, it, it, it destroys the whole thing when it comes to the grace of God. Why? Because we are stealing the glory that is owed to God and taking some of it for ourselves. If you go to heaven, it will be because you recognize that Jesus paid it all and all to him I owe. Somebody say amen. Okay? Jesus paid it all. Don't get the idea. You can add anything to God's grace because when you do, you take away from God's glory by attempting to claim some glory for yourself. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says this, it is by grace we have been saved through faith and not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works so that nobody can boast. You see, salvation today is a gift of Almighty God. So don't boast about it. Don't boast about it. I love going to the zoo, but I want you to know that there's going to be no peacocks in heaven. There'll be no Christians in heaven strutting around saying, look at me, see all the good stuff I've done. Look at how holy I've been. Look at all the things I did for the Lord. Man, I got myself. No, there are going to be no peacocks in heaven talking about everything they've accomplished for the Lord and who they were. When I was in the 10th grade, I played football uh, for Austin High School. A little place in southern Indiana. We were playing, I remember, our biggest rival one Friday night, Scottsburg. Scottsburg High. You're from southern Indiana. You probably heard of that. We were playing Scottsburg one Friday night. I remember it was raining. It was, a, it was horrible. And, and there must have been two inches of water on the field. I have no clue how much it really was. But this I do know. When you stepped on the field, the water came over the top of your cleat. That's what I know. I mean, it was a terrible night. Our uniforms were soaking wet, uh, and, uh, and it was cold, and it was just raining, and it was nasty, horrible day. But we were on defense at that time, and their quarterback threw a pass. And I remember it was tipped up in the air, and, and lo and behold, our, defense, our, our defensive tackle, who was on, uh, 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 who, he, he, just, he just went at the right place at the right time, put his arms out, and the pass fell right into his arms. It landed right into his arms. Now, mind you, he's a big boy. I mean, he was a big 
boy, big boy. But he'd intercepted a pass now for the first time in his entire life. Now, I want to tell you, being a big boy, he was the slowest man on our team. But you know what? As fate would have it, that sucker ran that thing all the way back to the end zone and scored a touchdown for us, man. Now, mind you, we had to block every guy on their team three times to get him to do it, but he did it, right? He did it, and we got a touchdown. It was amazing. But you know what? Of all the nights I spent the night with that guy after the game that night, and all night long, what do you think I heard? All night long, I heard all I heard was about his moves and his juke and his running and how he got a touchdown bragging all night long about how he did it, how he did it, how he did it. Boy, I'll tell you what, I'd sure hate to be spending, I'd sure hate to have to spend eternity with somebody who's in heaven bragging because they're so holy. I want to be with people who give the Lamb of God the glory he deserves. Amen? I want to be with people who give Jesus the glory. What is salvation by grace? Do? It respects God's glory. Here's what else it does. It receives uh, God's gift. Uh, for, uh, verse 3 says, Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. Now the word God counted unto him implies or means that God credited unto him. God imputed to him righteousness. Okay? God said uh, Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. In verse 6 of Romans 4, David said the same thing when he spoke of the blessedness of the one whom God credits righteousness apart from works. In verse 8, blessed is the one in whose sin the Lord will never count against him. The last part of verse 9, Abraham's faith was credited to him, credited to him as righteousness. Verse 10 asked, under what circumstances was it credited? Verse 11, the righteousness might be credited to us. In verse 22, it was credited unto him as righteousness. Verse 23, it was credited unto him. Verse 24, also for us to whom God will credit righteousness. So over and over again in scripture, Paul is talking about something being credited to or imputed to Abraham. Why? Because the way you get saved is for God to credit something onto your account. You see, this is what God does. God credits his righteousness onto you and me when we operate in faith, when we believe God for who he is and for, and, and for what he promises like Abraham believed, God credits righteousness unto us. Now let me tell you something about crediting and imputing when it comes to the Bible. Okay? Adam's sin was imputed to you. Adam's sin was imputed to me. Meaning Adam's sin was placed upon your account. You say, well, preacher, that ain't fair. I didn't have nothing to do with Adam. I wasn't there in the Garden of Eden. I didn't ask for that to happen. I didn't do that. I didn't do what he did. Uh, what Adam did doesn't have anything to do with me. Really? Well, I want to ask you a simple question. If Adam hadn't had any children, where would you be today? Let me help you with that. Non-existent. Because every one of us are a descendant from Adam. It is from Adam that we all came from. And when Adam sinned, uh, he became a slave to sin. And I want you to know that a child of a slave becomes a slave themselves. Okay? We are a slave. You see, you and I have inherited Adam's sinful nature and Adam's excuse making. And so the culpability for Adam's actions uh, has been placed upon us. Let me give you a verse that confirms that if you don't believe me. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. When Adam sinned, sin entered the entire world. And Adam's sin brought death so that death spread to everyone for everyone has sinned. Uh, see, death was imputed to everyone. Death spread to everyone because sin has been imputed into us through Almighty God. I hope as a church that you understand that. And I hope you get that today. Adam's sin has been credited to us. But then look here, our sin uh, was ascribed to Jesus, and that is good news. Somebody say amen. That's what the good news is all about, okay? Romans 4, 25, Jesus was handed over to die because of our sin and was raised to life to make us right with God. You see, Jesus died uh, not because of his sin, but for our sin, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, says God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. 
And that means this morning that Jesus Christ is, was, and is the spotless and sinless Lamb of God. And don't be confused about that. God did not make Jesus a sinner. God made Jesus the substitute. Adam's sin was put on me. My sin was put on Jesus. And Jesus carried that sin to the cross. Anybody ever heard the term scapegoat? You know where that come from? That that, uh, that comes from in the Old Testament the Old Testament would always give people pictures and illustrations uh, of salvation God would always do that throughout the Old Testament matter of fact the entire Bible speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ and of the Messiah okay and so in the Old Testament God gave people illustration of salvation one of them is in Leviticus chapter 16 what they would do is they would bring two goats to the gate of the tabernacle one would have his throat cut and the blood would spill out all over the ground it was an illustration of Jesus's death on the cross and of his blood being shed uh, for the sins of mankind Uh, but the high priest would lay his hands on the other goat and what he would do is that that he, he would confess the sins of the people on the head of that goat that goat was called the scapegoat The goat would then be led out into the wilderness and set free. But when the priest laid his hands on the head of that goat, symbolically speaking, the sins of the people were being imputed or credited upon the head of that goat. And that was a picture of our sins being laid upon the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, friend, Adam's sin was imputed to all mankind. Our sin was laid upon Jesus, and Jesus carried that sin to the cross. And let me tell you something. Thank God. Here's the good news. Jesus' righteousness today has been imputed to you and to me. And that's the good news. That's the gospel. That his righteousness is imputed to us. Verse 3. Abraham believed God. God counted him as righteous because of it. That's what Abraham discovered. God, see Abraham didn't do anything but believe. It was what God did that saved Abraham. What Abraham discovered was the grace of Almighty God. Somebody say amen. He discovered God's goodness and God's grace. And let's look at the grace that, and, but not only, he wasn't the only one in the Bible to talk about it. Let's look at the grace that David described because David goes on and describes it further. He noticed Abraham discovered it, but David now is describing it. And here's what he said beginning in verse 6. David also spoke of this grace when he described the happiness of those who declared who are declared righteous without working for it. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience, that is those who go off the rails by their own actions. What joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. What joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. The Hebrew people thought of Abraham as one of the greatest of their saints. But they thought of David as one of the greatest of the sinners because David was a man who committed adultery and in an attempt to cover it up he committed murder it was one of the darkest tales in all of uh, uh, of Israel's kings uh, he had broken God's commands and truth be told uh, not only in his culture but before God he deserved death and he wrote about it in the 32nd Psalm that's why Paul's quoting here and that's what Paul's quoting here excuse me in Romans 4 uh, uh, he, he, he's quoting Psalm chapter 32, verse 1 and 2. He said, Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose record is cleared, those who are cleared of guilt and can now live in complete honesty. You see, David, uh, in his iniquity, there was nothing he could do. He could not make himself feel good uh, or be good or remove the guilt that was upon him. He knew that he deserved death. His case was hopeless apart from God's amazing grace. And that's the grace that David is writing about here in verse 6. Uh, David spoke of the grace when he described the happiness of those who were declared righteous without working for it. I'm telling you that David's position before God was absolutely helpless. But God imputed onto David's account his own righteousness. And David begins to describe it. And it's important that you understand the description of it because once you see it, it'll start to make you happy and I'm telling you I'm just sick of all the doom and gloom I'm ready for some good news amen 
This will make you happy when you hear David begin to describe the grace that Abraham discovered. Here it is. First of all, he says in verse 7, Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven. David says what? My sin is forgiven. Friend, in order for God to forgive your sin, somebody has to eat the cost. In order for something to be forgiven, somebody must always eat the cost. Somebody has to pay the price. There are no free pardons in heaven. I don't care what you've been taught. You hear that clear. There are no free pardons in heaven. <laughs> if any sin is forgiven, the one who does the forgiving <clears throat> bears the cost of that, bears the penalty for that. Let's suppose that, let me pick on my other deacon. Let's suppose that Brian Story steals $10 off of me. Let's suppose that Brian comes in here and I leave $10 on my desk. And Brian's in here on a Saturday morning with help and his wife and, and they're passing out uh, Thanksgiving baskets, you know, and he went and spent a little bit of that money to gather that up himself. And, and so he's in and he's like, things are tight, man, I want a whopper. So he walks into my office, he sees I left 10 bucks on my desk and that sucker rips me off of 10 bucks, right? Let's just say that that's a possibility. And he starts feeling guilty about it. And he said, well, you know what, preacher? I got to tell you something. <laughs> This is the situation. I wanted a Whopper. I was hungry. I seen 10 bucks, and I took the 10 bucks right off your desk, and I'm so sorry, but you know what, Pastor? I don't have it to give back because I already spent it on a Whopper meal, and I said, well, you know what, Brian? That's okay. That's all right, buddy. I mean, it's all right. You know, the minute I forgive him, what happens? It just cost me 10 bucks, right? Because he took my 10 bucks. So the minute I forgive him, it just cost me 10 bucks. I want you to know, when something is forgiven, somebody always pays the price. When God forgave your sins and mine, God absorbed the penalty. That's what Jesus did on the cross. God never overlooked sin. I want to say that to you again. God never overlooked sin. Let me say that a third time. God never overlooked sin. God just chooses to pay the price of that sin himself. And so it is by his grace that we are forgiven. And that's why I sing. That's why I pray. That's why I worship the Lord. But the good news is even better than that. David said, not only are my sins forgiven, he said they're covered. They're covered. Look at verse 7 as well. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. The King James said, whose sins are covered. Now, even if I forgive Brian for stealing from me, and I would, and he wouldn't, but I would, but even if I forgive Brian for stealing from me, you know what? Truth is, I'm a human being. I'd still know he did it. And I bet be a little hesitant to lay out $20 on my desk in the future, whatever it might be, you know. I mean, I might lay out dollar bills, but I ain't getting a 10 there because I ain't going to steal a whole $10 from me, whatever. Like, I'd still know he did it, right? I'd still know he did it, uh, but let me tell you something. When God forgives you, my friend, when God forgives your sin, God forgets about your sin. Somebody say, man, that's good news. That's good news. And that's why Micah 7, 19 said, I'll cast all their sins into the depths of the ocean. There are places in the Mariana Trench and, and other places in the, in, the, in the ocean, in the depths of the ocean where the pressure is so great that we don't go there. Nobody goes there. People don't go there. Nothing can live there. We don't go there. That's where God buries your sin. I thought about that a lot this week. Uh, God said in Isaiah 38, verse 17, I've put all your sins behind my back. I thought about that too. Matter of fact, I, I dwelled on that a lot in my prayer and preparation for this sermon. God put all your sins behind his back. God put my sins behind his back. Now, let me ask you, if your sin, you be my sin, are you a sinner? Okay, you be my sin. You're my sin. Now, if God, this is sin right here. Now, if God put, that's a little awkward. <laughs> if God puts all my sin behind his back, can God see my sin anymore? You say, well, yeah, preacher, all he's got to do is turn around. Okay, I'll turn around. Well, all you got to do is turn around. Okay, I'll turn around. Go ahead and sit down, sinner. 
You see, every time I turn around, where's my sin go? The Bible doesn't say it stays static and I turn around and now it's in front of God. The Bible says God put your sin behind his back. And so my sin always stays behind God's back. Hey, let me tell you something. If you want to get into measurements, you can measure the distance between the North Pole and the South Pole. And you will get a distance. But you cannot measure from east to west. It goes on and on and on. And that's why God says in Psalm 103 verse 12, God has removed our sin as far as the east is from the west. If I stand here, the east is always there. The west is always there in relation to where I'm standing. Whatever it is, north, south, east, west, whatever it is, it always goes on and on. It's infinite. And so here's what. Here's my point, friend. My point is no matter where you're at, God, God removes our sins. My sins are gone. And that is good news today. Somebody say amen. It even gets better than that. Much better. Not only is for God forgive your sin and cover your sin, David writes in verse 8, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. You see, once you get saved, God said, I'll never put it back onto your account again. Once you get saved, matter of fact, I'm never going to impute sin onto your account. God will never impute sin into the life of a saint. And that's what you and I are. God will never impute sin to us again. You say, but what if I, what if I sin after I got saved? What if I sin again after I get saved? Well, you know what, really? What if? That's a silly question. Some people tend to think, you know, they have the idea that if they're living right when they die, well, they'll go to heaven. But I want you to know if that's what you're counting on, that you're going to be living right in order to get you to heaven, you're probably headed to hell. I wouldn't trust the best 15 minutes of my life to earn my way into heaven. And I don't worry about the worst 15 minutes to condemn me to hell. Listen, we need to understand this. I'm telling you the church needs to get this. We all deserve hell. It doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. In fact, James 4. 17 says to him who knows to do good and doesn't do it to him it is sin and if anything you believe is not right Romans 14 23 if you do anything you believe is not right you are sinning so if I do something wrong I'm sinning if I fail to do something I know is right I'm sinning and Proverbs 24 verse 9 said even the plans and thoughts of foolishness are sin so that covers about every action in the human <laughs> in the human uh, experience does it not okay anything that we could commit or omit or even think uh, we are all guilty of sin. Do you think your goodness is going to get you into heaven? I'm telling you it won't, but God's grace will. Somebody say amen. God's grace will. And what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. Friend, if God were allowed to allow or to impute into your life even one half, a one little itty bitty omission or sin, I'm telling you, you would die and go to hell a sinner. Why? Because God is holy and God is perfect and God will not allow sin into heaven. But David says, God will not impute iniquity to me. Now that does not mean, church, that does not mean uh, uh, that we can sin without consequences and get away with it. Not if we're really saved, okay? Not if we're really saved. Uh, if you're really saved, I'm telling you, you are going to pay for your sins. But you will not pay for them in eternity. You will pay for them here and now. And that, But you know what? That's better than having to pay for them in eternity. But listen to me. God reserves the right in his time and in his measure to carry you to the woodshed and beat the daylights out of you. Why? I'll tell you why. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves and the Lord chastises those he accepts as his own. Amen? That's why we need to keep an assur a short account with God. Because I'm telling you, you don't want to come under the discipline of the Lord. It is no fun to be there. But for the saved, God will never impute sin onto your account. Because if he did... You would have to get resaved every time you sinned uh, in order to be cleared of that sin or you would face punishment in eternity for that sin. I'm telling you, God will not attribute to your life sin. And when you understand God's grace, then you can understand why John Newton 
When the lights came on and he got it, he sat down and wrote a song from the heart. Amazing grace. Man, there's nothing sweeter than that sound that saved a wretch like me. I was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but I get it now. Now I see. Somebody give the Lord praise. Now I see. It's God. It's all God. It's always been all God. It was grace that Abraham discovered. It was grace that David described. And I want you to see one more thing. It was grace. It's grace that Paul begins to disclose in Romans 4 beginning in verse 6. David spoke of this grace when he described the happiness of those who are declared righteous without working for it. What joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. What joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared. But then he asked in verse 9. Is this blessing only for the Jews or is it for the uncircumcised Gentiles as well? We've been saying that Abraham was counted as righteous by God because of his faith. But how is that? How does that happen? Was he counted righteous only after he was circumcised or before he was circumcised? Clearly, God accepted Abraham before. Circumcision was only a sign that Abraham had already had faith and that God had already accepted him and declared him as, uh, to be righteous even before that. So Abraham is the spiritual father of those who have faith but have not yet had circumcision. They are counted as righteous because of their faith. Now what does all this mean? And by the way, there's a whole lot of talk about circumcision here. So what in the world does all of this stuff mean? Well, Paul is talking to the Gentiles now. And let me clear that up for you. That's to you and me. Paul is talking to us. And here's what he's saying. He's saying this thing called grace, this is what Abraham discovered. It's what David is describing. But look, it's for everybody. It's not just for the Jews. It's for the Gentiles as well. And what he is saying is this. Listen to me. Salvation does not come by ritual. Amen? Salvation does not come by ritual. It's for everybody. See, circumcision was a Jewish rite. It was a sign and a seal. And Paul asked in verse 10, what about these Gentiles? When Abraham was saved, he said, when was he saved? And he was a, when was Abraham saved? Before, after that seal. And he answers it and he said, clearly God accepted Abraham before the seal. You say, well, how does that apply to me today? Because I'm not in the Old Testament, Pastor. Well, let me ask you this. What do we do that shows salvation? Hmm. We have something right over here that we do, do we not? That shows our salvation. And so I want to ask you, are we saved before we do that? Or are we saved after we do that? Are we saved before baptism? Are we saved after baptism? You see, the Bible never says be baptized and then believe. It always says believe and then be baptized. Amen? It said believe. See, some people say, think that you've got to be baptized in order to be saved. Uh, there are big churches in this area, Catholic and Lutheran churches, that teach that you've got to be baptized to go to heaven. I'm telling you, it's just the community in which we live. Some people teach that you've got to be baptized in order, to, in order to get to heaven. But I'm telling you, that's not what the scriptures teach. When you say you have to be baptized in order to be saved, what you're doing is you're taking uh, the whosoever believes shall be saved out of the Bible. And according to that theology, a man who's stranded in the desert, desert uh, and about ready to die couldn't be saved if he dies before he reaches water and according to that theology somebody going down on an airplane that's about to crash can't be saved because there's no time to get baptized before they hit the dirt and according to that theology a man in a submarine that has lost power that is stranded on the ocean floor as ironic as it may sound surrounded by water cannot be saved without opening the hatch uh, and letting the water in and drowning at the same time it is silly the bible clearly has and very plainly states in Acts chapter 16 and verse 31 that those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. Somebody say amen. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. In Acts chapter 10 and verse 47, and when Peter baptized the entire household of Cornelius, Peter asked, can anyone object to their being baptized now that they've received the Holy Spirit just as we did? Meaning they'd already received the gift of God. They'd already experienced God. They already had God before they were baptized. And so it didn't happen afterwards. It happened before. And what Paul is saying is that salvation is not by ritual. And it doesn't come by doing something and working towards it and resolve. Uh, it, do- it is simply, simply, simply by God's amazing grace. Amazing grace. 
How sweet the sound that saved a bunch of wretches like us. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Now I get it. It's God's grace. And all God's people said, bow your heads in prayer. Friend, there are religious people who know a lot of stuff that are not going to be in heaven. Only those who trust the grace of God are going to be there. Which one of you, time will definitely tell, there will come a day, one chosen for us and not by us, when all things will be revealed for what they really are. The problem is that that day comes and you haven't got this right. Sadly, it will be too late. But it will not be God who sends a person to heaven, for God sends no man to hell. We send ourselves by elevating ourselves and rejecting the grace of God. Lord Jesus, forgive my sin and help me to put my trust in your grace and your love in Jesus' name. Amen.